All right, let's go. Okay. Hello, everyone. Thanks for coming. Uh, just to understand a bit who I have in front of me, how many of you drank more than three beers yesterday? Uh, Excellent. You don't remember it. You don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> I got six, so yeah, more than three. More than three. Okay, forget. <laughs> okay, now seriously, uh, how many of you were at the talk uh, of the two Slovakian guys last year here in this room? Okay. Yeah. Okay, so uh, for those who weren't here, there were two Slovakian guys <coughs> that have a work in an internet provider in Slovakia and uh, they uh, manage their OpenStack infrastructure with CF Engine. And uh, I asked them how they, um, since they talked about different parts of the code that they use for different things, I asked them how they version them and they said that they have had separate repositories for each part which surprised me a bit because I was coming from that approach and got really beaten for that. So yes, I said maybe it's something to write a blog post and maybe to <coughs> have a seminar about that talk. So what's the problem? Yeah, we have a problem to solve. All of us have gone through that problem and probably get, got beaten. Uh, we did it. We did it damn wrong tried to solve it and went down wrong and we did it better. That's the story uh, and uh, this approach may not be suitable for you but at least I hope it will give you ideas if you are running into the same kind of trouble. So what the problem is? The problem is uh, structuring code repositories, let's say git repositories for short and uh, your deployment procedures so that it's efficient uh, it's easy to, to work with them. And it's not a trigger problem. We are used to do uh, at least three kind of operations with our configuration management code. We do deployments, we do rollbacks, and we hope to deploy the right thing in the right place. Uh, these things are all uh, made easier by using a Git version control system repository, whatever it is, if you have the right structure and the right tools. Otherwise, it's not going to help. So, uh, if you come to this problem and you are green, or you come from uh, another field that is not configuration management that has it already its uh, established best practices, you may ask yourself, should I have one repository per project, or one for all? And uh, depending on how you answer this, uh, this question, you have more questions coming, like you can have one repository per project and maybe one for, let's say, libraries or code that is shared across different projects. But in that case, when you deploy your code in a certain place and you want to roll back, how do you know what you deployed of the shared code before? What was that, the version of that code? Because it's two separate repositories, so you have to make the two things come together and if you don't know the point in time when you did that last time it may be difficult to know to, to roll back second thing well, should I have one repository for all? okay, maybe yes then how do you make things uh, how, how do you design your repository so that deploying a project is not a messy process the libraries and code project code merge gracefully on the hosts. Or uh, maybe mixing these things, isn't it already fucked up? Yeah, so for project branches, shared code in a master, uh, what? Well, uh, I hope not to sadden you by saying that the answer is it depends. It depends on your needs, your uh, coding procedures, your, your, your habits. And there is no one-size-fits-all solution. Uh, in other, in other uh, environments, in other parts of IT, uh, we are lucky enough to have best practices and uh, 
some people that has already went into the wrong ways and wrote very good pieces about how to do things right. But for configuration management, this is not happening yet. And uh, if you were at the panel yesterday, you have heard that one thing that we are doing wrong is that we are redoing the same things over and over. And when you redo things, you also redo some of the previous mistakes. That's our case. <coughs> So, uh, when you happen to have to tackle this problem, all you have is a lot of crap on the network, how to solve that problem. You have your knowledge of uh, the configuration management tool, let's say, uh, sorry, yes, the configuration management tool and uh, let's say Git, your common sense, your previous experience on in other, other fields, and then brace for impact. Because it may be, maybe it's the, that approach is not going to help you. So, how we try to solve that problems ourselves? Uh, in the beginning, we had this mess. It was puppet code, and it was just one project. So we had one repository for the puppet code, one repository for the tools that we use to do other things like deployments and so on, and then the documentation was in yet another place. And uh, the thing that was quite convenient here was that the repository, the Puppet Code repository, was structured exactly as a thing that would go, could go in Puppet Master directly. So you could just do an rsync, deploy it. It was very neat, very convenient, and it was the trap. In fact, when we switched to CF Engine, uh, this thing, uh, the, the shortcomings of this approach, didn't bubble up yet. So we repeated the same approach because this rsync thing, you do one rsync and it's deployed, it was too neat. So yes, same structure. And then other projects come in. That's bad. So now we have two projects and we have things to share but also things to keep separate because it's two different things, two different customers. Well, okay, how we could do that? Damn, this rsync is so neat. Ha! I have a great idea! There it is! Two branches per project. One is the master branch for the project, one is the development branch for the project. And uh, where do we keep the shared code? Well, in master. Master is master, right? So we can still rsync this out and uh, deploy. That's fine. That's neat. And uh, what if I uh, do improvements to the common code here in this branch? Oh yes, well you should merge shared code back and forth between projects. Yes. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Oh. Mess. Because since master was none of the other things, <coughs> and you had to merge the code manually, it was conflicts all the time. It was tedious, it was a long process. It was manual process. So we tended to delay that, so the master branch was lagging behind the project branches, so nothing was in sync anymore. I could tell you horror stories, but you got the idea. This approach was not going to, to scale, especially when another project was starting to come in. We needed to do a bit better. Just a bit. So this was uh, spring of uh, 2013. I said, well, okay, I will tackle this problem once again. And uh, it was good to share the code, but uh, we needed to keep some separation. That's right. New approach. We all live in a, a yellow repository, or I don't know, uh, all the, all the code, that, code for all projects in the same place. Tools in the same place. And the rsync thing, sorry, we couldn't keep it as it was, but we still keep it in another way. And the way that we found was that instead of having the repository structured as a master files directory for CF Engine, we had uh, separate directories that were pieces of master files. Let's say an Opera project with uh, its controls, files, <coughs> and its devcf, and its libraries, and so on. 
and only the files that were relevant to the project. What about the libraries and the tools? Another directory, RL directory, on the side with all the pieces that were supposed to be common, but if they weren't, it was not a problem. We'll see it in a second. And the tools repository, oh, it's here. Okay, that's fine. But then how do you deploy this? Well, you merge it at deployment time. And how did we, did we do that? You may like it or not, we use the make file. We use a make file. So how does it work? When you run, let's say, make deploy specifying the project and specifying the branch and uh, all the parameters that are needed to do a deployment, the make file creates a temporary directory, then throws the common part in there, and then <coughs> throws the project part over that. So that if you had, let's say, the same file here and a project-specific file here, this one will override the common one. And if this project doesn't have this file, then it's good to have the common one, and so forth. And then you have a <coughs> full master files directory here that now you are synced out. And of course, when you finish, you remove the temporary directory, and it's done. Does it work? Yes, it works. But, but, is it really comfortable to work with a, such a common <coughs> line? Make dash C, blah, 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 deploy, project, equal, blah, blah, blah. But a bit too long, a bit complicated. And that was one of the problems. The other one is optimized to deploy on just one hub. So if you want to deploy on all the hubs that are uh, attached to a project, what do you have to do? You have to maybe remember all the <coughs> hubs and put them in a loop, <coughs> and make will create and destroy the directory 10 times. And uh, what if you forget some hubs? So you have to maintain lists of hubs start separate from the make file. <coughs> and what else? If you happen to not keep a list for, for each project and forget some hubs, they will be left behind and you won't even notice unless you have other things in place. So it's um, these kind of things where keeping people that were interested in uh, making tiny changes in text files to change the external load classification information away from just changing a text file and doing deployment because doing this was so easy to get it wrong that nobody did, did want to do that. So we had to make yet another improvement. And that's where our CF deploy was born. A front end to make. So we didn't kill make. We just kept it hidden in a safe place. It was a bash script initially. That did the job. But, but, it needed two configuration files for each triple project environment location. What, what does it mean? It means that, let's say you want to deploy project Opera on all production and pre-production hubs in all locations two files. Uh, only pre-production hubs in Oslo. Okay, two more configuration files. Uh, all production and pre-production, but just in uh, Amsterdam. Two more. Deploying testing. Two more. It works, but when we got to this situation where we had 231 lines of bash, if you count the blank lines and comments, or otherwise 165 code lines, and more than 40 config files with 348 in total. So you see that the whole bunch of this, you have configuration files that are doubling the size of your code. <coughs> no, we can do better. 
that's where we uh, and we needed more functions <coughs> as well, more more things that the script could do. So we just switched to Perl, <coughs> which is a bit bigger. We have more functions, but we have just two config files. So it's a bit bigger, but now it's also friendlier for for users to add or change something in the project. Why? Because it's CSV-like files. One is like this. You map a project name to the directory in the repository to the type of project. We'll see it in a second what the type is. And the other file maps a location to the project, to the environment, to the home. All in line. So what does CF Deploy do? It uh, reads the first file and uh, decides, you, so you say, let's say, CF deploy Opera. So it checks in the first file uh, which subdirectory should be merged with common together with Opera. And uh, uh, it checks if the project is remote, so it has to rsync to a remote directory, remote server, or it's local, so it must rsync to a local file system. That's what remote or local is. <coughs> then, it reads the other file and it calculates a list of hubs to deploy to. If the list is empty, it screams loudly and bails out. Of course, if it's remote, if it's local, it checks which directory it should deploy to. And finally, it runs the requested action for you. It runs the make, the ugly make line for you. Let's see it in uh, action. To deploy a project in a single hub, we had to do this before. <coughs> now, to deploy it on a, any number of hubs, we just specify the project, we do this, or even shorter, this. The default action of CF deploy is unsurprisingly deployed. What if you want to see which files will be touched by a deployment without actually deploying them? rsync n There we go. Before, <coughs> one hub, CF deploy preview project name. And that will create the directory, create everything, run an rsync dry run, show you the files, and then do whatever suits you. Uh, what if you want to see the difference between the files that you are going to deploy and the files that are on a certain hub? That's doable. This was before and this is now. Diff project name, hub, name, address, whatever. If you want to operate on a branch other than master, because this, all these comments that we have seen so far default to master branch, well, you just add another keyword, branch, and you specify the name. So action, project name, branch, branch name. And of course, since it's not strictly a branch name when you're using git, you can also use a commit id, a tag, and it works. It still works. So you can, uh, for example, roll back a deployment by specifying the tag if you put one. <coughs> Otherwise, look for the commit id and enjoy. Uh, if you want to operate on a specific environment, this was before, you had to remember the list of the hubs in that environment, now you do a little trick, you say action, well, which action, let's say deploy, and then project name, dash, and the environment. What happens under the hood is that CF deploy will split at the dash and then match the string at the right side <coughs> against the environment and against the location, and then calculate the list. This means that if you want to deploy on a certain location, this also works. <coughs> I found it quite convenient in a few cases. Uh, list all hubs? No way before. You had to, again, maintain separate list of hubs and keep them in sync with the tool. Now they are part of the tool because they are part of the configuration of the tool. So you can do list hubs if you are interested in the non-test ones. Quite handy if you have to, let's say, go to all hubs quickly and uh, upgrade libc because there is a mess coming. 
so you have the list of the hubs in, uh, that are probably exposed to the public with just list hubs without messing with the test ones. But if, if you absolutely need all hubs, then you specify list all hubs. More? Yes, you can list the projects and you can have the tool uh, describe the project. So if it's a <coughs> local project, it will say uh, where the directory is, for example, where it would deploy. If you use a remote project, it will list the hubs related to that project. And if you do, let's say, CF deploy show example dash Ghent, it still works. It will tell you <coughs> which hubs will be used if you do CF deploy example dash Ghent. That's the solution that we wanted. It's uh, functional, it's beautiful, especially for people like Yahweh. This is a bike lane, you know. Oh, I love it. <laughs> Where is that? Uh, in, the, in the UK, I think. No. <laughs> and anyway, it works. So, uh, summing up about uh, the, our problem and our solution. Uh, provided that this solution doesn't fit all environments. It's good for our specific, uh, for our specific needs. Uh, we have one repository for all projects. Everything is absolutely in one single thing. And uh, the libraries and project specific parts are measured deploy time, which means that you have these advantages. If you make improvements to the libraries, they will get to all projects automatically. You don't have those lags where you make improvements on one side and the other side is not getting them. And uh, we can use branches for what they were designed to, not to be a repository in a repository. And uh, if you don't like <coughs> this uh, rolling approach to deploy <coughs> libraries, one possible approach that still can work with this kind of uh, design is to branch out for a specific project so you have your version of the libraries that you keep so you know what you're deploying without having this rolling thing. And when you feel like you can do some integration on the new things that came into the libraries, and when you're ready, you merge again. So, it still can work. Shortcomings. Well, uh, if you need strong separation and have and deploy only the things that are relevant for a project in the hubs for the project, this doesn't work because all the libraries go out. So if you have, if you're interested <coughs> in 50% uh, of the library, you will get the other 50% as well. If you make a nasty mistake in the libraries that you can spot immediately, it propagates quickly to all projects, which would be not really convenient. And uh, so definitely it's not suitable for uh, approaches where you need a very strong separation between projects. So in that case, you have to improve this approach or use another one. Hazard? Questions? Yes. Can you stack more than two layers of uh, different directories and so on? Like having more than one common thing? <coughs> one command and one command for this uh, data center and one command. <coughs> you can do basically thing. everything uh, because all in all it's a make file that drives. And if the change in the make file is not enough, uh, you have also to change the tool. But again, they are cooperating. Ch with changing the tool, you probably you will need, let's say, uh, to be able to specify in one of the configuration files which directories, which libraries you want. At that point, yes, you could, for example, split the common one in smaller parts and just deploy those that you're interested in. That would work. 
Uh, do you have the different uh, privilege settings for the different uh, projects that uh, have the different what? Different privileges. Yes, for for committing to the different projects. Yes. Uh, and what uh, the different people and different teams can where the different <coughs> people can commit to. That's a good question. Thanks for asking. Uh, so to <coughs> we use uh, Gitolite <coughs> to uh, manage the access rights. To, to the Git repository. And it works like this. Uh, sysadmin people have permissions to do basically everything, but non fast forward changes, not fast forward push. I'm the only one who's allowed to. Mm. I'm the master keeper, if you want to call it. Mm. Then, for, uh, we have one project where uh, <coughs> I don't, uh, how can I say that? Um, yeah, well, there are uh, other um, colleagues in the company that are working mainly on that. We, we do only minor things on that. Uh, so they work, they have all permissions on their directories. Mm. And if they branch with a certain prefix, let's say yarle dash something, which, mm -hmm. since it's you that you that made the question, yeah. then they can do whatever they want on their branches. Mm. But regarding merging to master, they have, they have to ask us. Yeah. So we review the code, and if the code is okay, if they are not reinventing something that is in the libraries, for example, mm. uh, or if they are not doing really wrong things, then it's merging master. Yeah. Uh, if, they, if they are committing to the, their own uh, branch, so to say, yes. which is a different project, I would say? Or well, the, the repository is the yeah, same, yeah. but they have uh, full privilege to their, to, to, to their own directory right. and to their branches, to their own <coughs> branches when they name it uh, in a certain way. Yeah. And then when you have this uh, directory configured into the configuration file, mm -hmm. then it will be automatically deployed as well uh, as a part of their own uh, yes. project. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Without anyone else having to... Yes. Uh, yeah, one, uh, we, we are working, uh, we're working in, uh, in two ways. Uh, if they need a hotfix quickly, and they can do it themselves, mm. so they branch out, they do their hotfix, they deploy their branch mm. with that tool. Mm. And then they ask us if, it's the, if the code is okay. Mm. If it is, then we merge it into master and then they deploy master again. Mm. So it's clean. If the code is not good, mm -hmm. then we tell them what's wrong and what they should fix, yeah. so they still do that in their branch <coughs> and then again we go through the process. Okay. So it's, um, it's working well so far. Can everybody deploy? So if I deploy from not my project, is that say, say deploy project then? Good question again. Uh, since it's an rsync, yes. it all depends on uh, SSH keys. Yeah. And uh, uh, we have um, an homegrown system to deploy the SSH keys. So if, I, uh, if the people in that project try to deploy anything on our hubs, it will fail because they cannot connect to our hubs. But if they do that <coughs> on their hubs, it's fine. But it's a separate, uh, this access control, if you want to call it, it's uh, separate from, uh, from this. But it's quite possible that they will break not only their own whole Mitsif engine, but the, everything Mitsif engine if they deploy uh, the wrong thing, like syntax error or something like that. But they I guess that's, that's just an expectation that we need to put. Yeah, they will break their own stuff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, because, let's say the project is called X. So you have the directory called X for their project. And here they can do absolutely everything. But this will be deployed only on their hubs when they do CF deploy X. So they can't break the rest. No, but they will break the, on a node level uh, yes. everything. That, they uh, could. All, all their nodes basically. If possible, they could, right? yes. Uh, even if it's all a mistake inside some project specific code. Yeah. But that's. Uh, that's not a problem, I think, in this approach. Yeah. 
Well, that's rather a project that a uh, problem that uh, everyone should test their changes, and uh, that these are because once you can do, let's say, CF deploy project x dash test branch my dev, then this will select the right hubs. This will select the right branch. So that will still work. And one thing is that I never, or almost never, run this as the first thing. Because I know that I can deploy the wrong project on the wrong hubs. It can happen. Or the wrong branch. So what I always do before deploying is always a CF deploy preview what I'm going to do. And if it seems sensible, then edit the command line, remove preview, and write deploy. It's let's call them uh, good practices, best practices. <coughs> okay. Uh, since uh, I seem to have a few more minutes, uh, we go for something completely unrelated. <laughs> And uh, I know that those that were here before, last year, know what I'm going to talk about. Bear with me. Forgot to thank you. Uh, I didn't talk about me or my company, Opera Software, that sponsored this talk. Uh, you are smart people, so if you want to know something about me, what I do, and uh, if I'm a good person or not, you can use any of these things. And if you have comments on this talk, please address them to me. If they are constructive, they may be even bad, even things like don't speak at any event ever again. That's fine if it's a constructive thing. But it's not this what I want to talk about. I'll grab you one more minute to tell you that uh, tomorrow, the 4th of February, is the World Cancer Day. And uh, our family, my family, was uh, hit hard by cancer. Uh, we have lost, uh, I've lost my father because of cancer. And uh, the, there were a few unfortunate uh, things that went with that. And one of the unfortunate thing was that his type of cancer, they told him immediately, there are, for your type of cancer, three kinds of medicines. If one doesn't work, then you can try the second. If it doesn't work, you will try the third. And then. Uh, so, this is to stress out two things. The first is that cancer research is very important because it takes time to do research and to save lives lives of people that you may have very dear in your heart. So it's important that you donate to cancer research. You do it today and you have plenty of opportunities. These are the logos of some cancer research association in uh, Norway, Netherlands, Belgium, France, Italy. There are more, of course. Uh, you want to do it for the people you love. Because, you know, you, you never know when it happens, to who it will happen. So it's better to take some advantage and help research today. That's it. Yes? There is one step further than donating money, and that is donating time. And I will explain it. Mm -hmm. uh, it is based to uh, some thoughts I have uh, over recent years. Uh, as it admits, we are close to build machines, especially sometimes they are guys that we let the HPC. And I was thinking if we could uh, um, set up some kind of collaboration so that some scientists that they try to actually go through the, let's say, digital discovery of what's going to go with this kind of stuff that they have better access or better uh, uh, means at their disposal to go through. I will give an example that is a little bit more concrete. 
Um, on HPC sites, I'm looking at you because you are a <laughs> big place in Europe, just to hear an opinion. Um, often there is uh, cycles that go wasted just because of uh, uh, utilization patterns and so on. So uh, I think that uh, going to a 1% donation on best effort mode, which basically means no commitment on the side of the, okay. of the owner of the resources owner, and helping these scientists to go through, get access to these resources, I think that would be, uh, it doesn't really cost much on, side, on the side of anybody, but it can probably make a difference for some scientists. Yes, it could save money. <laughs> At the same time, because here what is really the biggest deal is that you, you, you try to strike the solution before the cancer hits somebody. This is really the most tricky part. And, uh, I tell you, sometimes uh, when I am on these platforms and I, and I see what kind of things are being run, uh, sometimes the simulations that are run are about uh, physics, about deep space and whatever you can imagine. Yeah, which is, which is great, it is totally great. I like to see all these advances in science, in science but you have to compare this to this kind of stories and uh, you have this question mark there. Well, we have a lot of these jobs on our questions. Yeah. yeah. So, I think also in such directions. If you want, that's a good suggestion, which calls me to do something immediately. So, I want you to bet against me. <laughs> Last year I ran two 10 kilometers races running. Mm -hmm at the pace of 6 minutes 40 seconds per kilometer, which is almost standing still. <laughs> and uh, I'm not <coughs> going to do that again the 25th of April in Oslo, if I don't break something, uh, for the uh, race is called Centrum Slope. So I, I want you to bet against me that I'm not going, I, I'm not in a good form because I had some things to care about in my body. So, uh, I bet that I will finish that race in uh, less than 6 minutes 40 seconds pace and uh, if I do that, I will donate 1000 kroner, let's say, to Kreft for Enningen. But uh, if I, let's say, if I don't make it, then you make a donation to any association. Or you want to swap it? That's fine. The, the, it's not really important the, the way we do that. It's important the goal. So here is a bet. I bet that I will finish it in uh, less than 6 minutes 40 seconds per kilometer. Mm -hmm. Want to bet against me? Thank you. Mm -hmm.